student of mine for many years. Okay, I think it's time to get started. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, I'm Gail Fenske, and it's an honor to introduce this panel with Leo Marx. I'm especially pleased that Professor Marx is able to join us. We are fortunate as well to be joined by a distinguished roster of panelists, John Bass, Mark Jarzenbeck, Adnan Morshed, and Rosalind Williams. The panel will discuss Professor Marx's recent essay, Technology, the Emergence of a Hazardous Concept. First, I'd like to introduce Leo Marx and the panelists, then provide a brief summary of the argument that Professor Marx presents in his essay. After this, I'll open the discussion among the panelists and then conclude with a few questions from the audience. Leo Marx is Kennan Professor of American Cultural History Emeritus at MIT. He is author of the classic work, The Machine in the Garden, Technology and the Pastoral Ideal in America, and co-editor of Does Technology Drive History? The Dilemma of Technological Determinism, among many other noted books and essays. He is twice a Guggenheim Fellow, a Rockefeller, a Rockefeller Fellow, and a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His work examines the relationship between technology and culture in 19th and 20th century America. John Bass is Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of British Columbia. His teaching and research is focused on contested landscapes. He is director of the Delta National Park Project, which is investigating technology and policy in the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta, California. Mark Jarzenbeck is professor of the History and Theory of Architecture and associate dean of Architecture and Planning at MIT. He is the author of On Leon Battista Alberti, His Literary and Aesthetic Theories, The Psychology, Psychologizing of Modernity, Art, Architecture, and History, and more recently of the text, A Global History of Architecture. He has worked extensively on 19th and 20th century aesthetics and on issues of architecture and modernity. Adnan Morshed is associate professor in the School of Architecture and Planning at Catholic University. He is author of the forthcoming book, The Aesthetics of Ascension, Airplanes, Skyscrapers, and the American Imagination of the Master Planner. Rosalind Williams is Bern Dibner Professor of the History of Science and Technology at MIT. Her books include Dream Worlds and Notes on the Underground, an essay on technology, society, and the imagination. She has worked extensively on the emergence of the built world as an environment for human life, emphasizing imaginative literature as a source of insight into the question, what are the implications for human life, both individual and collective, when we live in a predominantly self-constructed world? I'm a professor of architecture at Roger Williams University, author of The Skyscraper in the City, uh, the forthcoming book Skyscrapers, and co-editor of Alto in America. And uh, I have an interest in building technologies. Uh, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to read Professor Marx's essay, uh, I will begin the discussion with a summary of the argument that's presented in that essay. Uh, so here goes. <laughs> in his essay, Technology, the emergence of a hazardous concept. Leo Marx explains that technology is a surprisingly recent phenomenon as both a word and a concept. Rooted in techna, meaning art or craft, and ology, a branch of learning, technology first gained prominence in 1861. With the founding of MIT, it designated a field of study. But technology, in the familiar sense of the term, did not catch on in America until around 1900. Even then, it was confined to academic circles and did not gain popular currency until the 1930s. Thomas Carlyle, in his seminal essay of 1829, Signs of the Times, used machinery to describe certain advances in the mechanic arts. During the course of the next century, however, machinery proved to be unsuitable. This created a semantic void in the public discourse related to the mechanic arts, as well as science and invention. But why was technology preferable? Professor Marx argues that this can be explained by several developments that began in America in the 1840s, both ideological and substantial. From the ideological standpoint, 18th century Enlightenment thinkers had celebrated incremental advances in explicitly bounded enterprises such as the development of scientific instruments. But by the 1840s, 
the mechanic arts had expanded vastly, particularly as represented by the railroad and the telegraph, creating this semantic void that technology would eventually fulfill. The noted orator Daniel Webster, in a speech of 1847, dedica dedicating a branch of the Northern Railroad, extolled the progress of the age. He identified with the company's directors and stockholders, so in his view, wealth producing innovations like the railroad represented a socially transformative power of such scope and promise as to be the perfect embodiment of human progress. This blurring of the distinction between the mechanical means and the social political ends provoked an immediate ideological backlash. Henry David Thoreau, in his Walden of 1847, among others, viewed Webster's worshipful view of progress as a sign of perhaps moral negligence, political regression. In addition to these ideological changes, corresponding substantial or material changes contributed to the creation of this semantic void that technology would fulfill. In Carl Lyle's time, innovations in the mechanic arts were represented by freestanding mechanical devices. But by Webster's time, the discrete machine was being placed by a new kind of socio-technical system, a dramatic explosion of a new form of human power for which the existing vocabulary proved inadequate. The railroad incorporated not only a typifying mechanical component, the steam engine and ancillary equipment, but also a corporate business organization, a specially trained workforce of locomotive and civil engineers, and facilitating institutional change, changes such as a national system of standardized time zones. With the innovations of the so-called second industrial revolution around 1900, the concept technology gained wider currency. These innovations, among, those, the, among them those produced by the electrical industry, stemmed more directly from advances made in science. By now, the simple machines to which Carlyle had referred in the 1820s carried with them a derogatory legacy of social and intellectual inferiority. What people needed was a means of modernizing the outmoded lexicon of the mechanic arts, a concept that would effectively represent the large-scale complex socio-technical systems. If the mechanic arts belonged to the mundane world of work, technology belonged to a higher plane, a, social in, a, a plane of social and intellectual book learning, scientific research, and the university. Consequently, while it is customary to single out technology and its transformative power as the defining characteristic of the modern era, in fact, the, world, the word itself, technology, underwent a radical change. The term that had formerly named a field of study now referred to the society's entire stock of technical knowledge and equipment, and with it a blurring of boundaries between the material components and the systems themselves, as well as the erosion of the outer boundaries separating the whole of the technological system from the surrounding society and culture. The latter characterizes the automotive and global oil industries of the 20th century. The generalized character of the word technology, paradoxically, accounts for its efficacy in representing such an indescribably multifaceted entity or set of entities. For Professor Marx, the hazardous character of the concept technology is a consequence of this history. The very generality of the word allows it to supplant its more substantial precursors, but it also makes it susceptible to reification. Technology has acquired an objectivity so strictly rational, autonomous, and all-embracing as to conceal every trace of its fundamental nature, the relations between people. In contemporary discourse, technology is consigned to the realm of things, and as such, distracts our attention from the human, social, economic, and political relations that largely determine who uses the technologies and for what purposes. Technology, as such, makes nothing happen. But its popularity as the primary force in shaping the future is increasingly matched by our reliance on instrumental standards of judgment, and with them, a corresponding neglect of moral and political standards in making just decisions about the direction of society. So that is uh, the argument, and uh, I now would like to open the discussion to our panelists.
Um, and uh, each of them represents an array of interests that I uh, find intersect in intriguing ways with Professor Marx's argument uh, in this essay about technology. And so I'd uh, like to ask each panelist to respond uh, to the argument, um, then to comment on its intersection with their own work or academic interests. Uh, and I've also asked them each to pose a question uh, for Professor Marx. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with Adnan Morshed, uh, simply because uh, he has a historical interest in this concept and um, I know will provide um, an illuminating um, uh, historical frame of reference uh, for our discussion. And then after that, I'd like to move to Mr. Bass and uh, Ms. Williams and finally Mark Darzenbeck. Well, so, Adnan. Well, I'm, I'm humbled by this uh, order of uh, uh, making comments. Uh, but I'm also humbled by the fact that uh, three of my PhD uh, members, committee members, are here. Two are here on the at the table, and one at the, in the audience, uh, Stanford Anderson. Can you hear me at the back? Um, I know that. Uh, so let me jump into right into uh, my response to. I want to divide my response to uh, Professor Marx's. Uh, article, The Hazardous Concept of Technology, in two ways. Uh, the first, I would like to respond to the article itself, and then I would like to follow up with a few questions. And to respond to uh, Professor Marx's idea, uh, uh, article, uh, just very basically, uh, you know, let me d try to distill the argument. His argument is that uh, technology uh, as, as we understand it today, did not exist in the early, twin, early 19th century. It was more represented by the concept of mechanic arts. And mecha what does mechanic arts mean? Uh, mechanic arts basically suggests discrete machines, machines that had uh, cir circumscribed locations in the society, machines that were distinguishable, that were clearly identifiable, they were tangible. There is almost a haptic quality to the machines. And uh, Thomas Carlyle's 19, uh, 1829 speech that how do you represent the 19th century? And uh, Carlyle's response was that the one word that could represent the 19th century uh, feelings about industrial uh, capitalism was machinery. And uh, uh, Professor Marx also mentions uh, the, fa the founding fathers of America that uh, even though the founding fathers talked about machines, but for them machines did not imply, uh, imply the kind of the expanded meanings of technology that we can talk about so comfortably today. For them, the essential political goal was the, 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 the republic, the, uh, the republican ideals, the ideal political uh, situation, that was the goal. And technology was the means to get to that point. Uh, so uh, machines was the determining factor, but uh, Professor Marx talks about how that meaning of the machines gradually transformed in the early decades of the 20th century. And he talks about Daniel Webster's 1947 uh, speech uh, in the, at the dedication ceremony of a railway station in New Hampshire, and where Daniel Webster talks about a new age that was dawning on civilization, that was emerging, a civilization that was defined by a complex network of machines that was uh, uh, that was not the machines that Thomas Car uh, Carlyle described so uh, it was the technological enterprise it was a pretty complex network of machines that created an abstract entity abstract series of uh, enterprises and uh, uh, so that's essentially the uh, core argument of, of uh, Professor Marx that uh, the idea of machines change, and in the early decades of the 20th century, technology meant very different, uh, uh, very different ideas, conveyed very different ideas than the early 19th century. But my point is the, my interest is really in the word hazardous. Why is it hazardous? It's hazardous, the technology, the way it conveys its expanded set of meanings in the early 20th century, uh, 
It's hazardous because it has, it has a tendency to replace human agency as an agent of social transformation. It has, a, it has become a kind of a transformative force, the way human agency, the human mind, could enforce transformation in society. So in that sense, the, war, the idea of technology is hazardous. But what I find really interesting in uh, Professor Marx's article is the idea of primacy of, in fact, he ends his article with a very, very poignant sentence that it's the, uh, the idea of paradoxical effects of reification, that technology has a propensity to replace human agency as a, as a political will to transform society. So in a way, I believe that Professor Marx ultimately is talking about human agency in society, human agency as the, the force to transform society, the political will itself, rather the machinery. The machinery, the technology as a way of transform society, he, there is an, a bit of anxiety about that. So he, what he is talking about, uh, the uh, kind of an anxiety uh, about the transformative force of society. The human agency is the vital force that, that could take society to the future. What I also find very interesting about uh, Professor Marx's idea, uh, article is that in the end, this is sort of my interpretation of course, in the end, the, I, I think the article also talks about an unromanticized environmentalism, that you can ultimately reclaim some pastoral values, the values that had been contaminated by technology. You, one can ultimately reclaim some pastoral values that are not at odds with technology, but actually have a very rich, ambivalent, dialectical relationship with technology, and that pastoral value can still exist with a kind of a very uh, ambivalent, nonetheless rich dialectical relationship with technology. So I wanna, uh, so that's a, my response to the article itself, but I wanna uh, leave uh, you with a few questions. Number one question is, is Professor Marx talk about, talks about the kind of this technology's expanded meaning happening in the early decades of the 20th century, and I ask, why in the early decades of the 20th century that technology was, was, uh, was, was, has acquired uh, such an expanded series of meanings. Uh, and it would be rather, uh, rather limiting to claim that uh, Veblen or Charles Baird uh, uh, and a couple of other elite theorists uh, sort of gave that help uh, give technology, this expanded series of meanings. Uh, and I would like to, uh, I would like to argue that, uh, that the space of popular culture, the space of mass culture, perhaps accounted for technology's uh, expanded meaning in the early decades of the 20th century. And so we, perhaps we should explore the, the space of popular culture, mass culture, uh, uh, you know, for the, for the, for, uh, the techno for technologies, this broad set of meanings that it would convey, uh, the hazardous, hazardous meanings that it could convey in the early 20th century. And then I would like to also ask, uh, the number two question is the actual experience of technology. The actual experience of technology, uh, if you look back at uh, Professor Marx's scholarship, you will see that his primary avenue is literature, literary criticism. He goes to, he addresses the ambivalence about, te about technology's role via literature, via, uh, I would rather say that via high culture, uh, uh, this, this elite literature that, ha that has been enshrined in the, in the imagination of the idea of America, the works of uh, 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 Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, Whitman and others in the early, in, in the middle of the 19th century. But I would like to talk about, uh, in, a, in, a, in a vein, in a, in a way to expand his scholarship, could we ask 
perhaps what is the role of high bro culture and low bro culture and we can t we can think about the works of van wick uh, 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 Van Wyck Brooks, uh, who talked about in his book in 1915, uh, that uh, uh, the book in his book uh, uh, America's Coming of Age, Brooks talked about high bro culture and low bro culture, and uh, and in in a way to uh, we we can also talk about George Santayana's uh, work, Gentile Tradition, and. Uh, the kind of the low bro tradition, the aggressive enterprise, as he called it. So, how can we sort of make a sort of a uh, sort of a fertile discussion about high bro high brow culture and low brow culture, and how they kind of contributed to the these expanded meanings of technology? But my most interesting question, after read, after you know doing research on. Uh, Professor Marx's scholarship that, uh, that he spent uh, half a century, I would say, from the middle of the 19th, 20th century. My most, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, sort of, the most poignant question that I find from his, uh, from his scholarship is the kind of the meaning of America as, the, as future the set of this, this entrenched myth that America uh, is future, America as, uh, as utopia. So this has, been, this has been an entrenched ideology that played a vital role in creating the idea of America for, for centuries. And uh, I would like to mention two authors who played really interesting interesting uh, sort of roles in explicating this idea that America is the future, this myth that America is future. And one is Fred Pollock, who talked about two types of utopias. One is the active utopia, and the other is the passive utopia. America, and he talked about America is an active utopia where uh, the future is not just a future out there, a foreordained, a foreordained utopia, a foreordained future, rather a buildable, buildable future, a future that you can build. In fact, I would remind you that the 1939 World's Fair, the motto was building the world of tomorrow with the tools of today. So in a way, it kind of summarizes the ideology of a buildable future, which was integral to the idea of America. So, in fact, I will, when I was coming to Boston this, mo uh, this morning on the plane, I was reading the newspaper, and President o uh, Obama said something which really uh, fascinated me. He said that innovation is what America has always been about. So what he meant, I, th I thought, was that the innovation, innovation or the, uh, the t building the technology to create an ideal future, to create an ideal world for America is central to the idea of this country. And I think that needs to be stressed in this scholarship, what, how technology, how a very distinctive myth around techno technology was created to reinforce the idea of America as utopia, that W the, a buildable future that you can build with the tools, with technology, with machines. I think that needs to be, the, needs to be uh, emphasized. But I also want to raise another question is the sort of the more uh, uh, the pertaining to the more contemporary digital culture in which there is a cult of the mind. Some of the, these uh, cyber geeks, if you will, we're talking about the cult of the mind, that you can create the future does not need the bodies. The future does not need the flesh. The future can be built on entirety of the mind, the cult of the mind, as they call it. So what I find ironic is that what Professor Marx, in his scholarship, talked about, or rather expressed, expressed anxiety about technology taking control or superseding human agency, 
here in the more contemporary digital sort of the, these uh, in a kind of a very digitized world, we are talking about the cult of the mind where you are creating a super, super mind, if you will, uh, a, or in Buckminster Fuller, who called it uh, in, back in the 1920s, phantom captain, this super consciousness that you create by means of technology. So the distinction between technology and human agency is in increasingly blurred in the contemporary usage of technology. I think that, uh, that really poses a very interesting question and my final question would be, uh, this might startle Professor Marx and others, and uh, what can we perhaps uh, sort of begin a history contextualizing Professor Marx's work in the in the heyday of Cold War ideologies, whether his work in 19, as you know, his uh, first his book, Machine in the Gar the Machine in the Garden, was published in 1964. That was actually a time when a lot of these subversive books were coming out. I'm, I'm, I don't, by any means, mean to call Professor Marx's book, The Machine in the Garden, subversive. But there were also a lot of books that were coming out uh, two years ago. Uh, Rachel Carson's book, uh, uh, The Silent Spring, came out. And in fact, one could make a connection between uh, uh, The Silent Spring and uh, The Machine in the Garden in the sense that Rachel Carson also was also ta talking about landscape, nature, and, and, and the this pastoral sublime that has been intruded with industrial pesticide. So there is a kind of an anxiety over technology. And, uh, and there are other books uh, coming out. Daniel Bell's book, The End of Ideology, which was published in 19, uh, 1960, four years before Professor Marx's book, that was kind of, in a way, is a kind of saying, uh, a kind of a defense of status quo that liberal ideologies was the end of history. So in a way, can we situate Professor Marx's work in a kind of a critical environmentalism that we see growing increasingly today. Thank you very much. Do you want me to respond yeah, now? Yeah, yes, Leo, do you have a response to uh, any of these questions or issues that have been raised? Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> the the elephant in your room, um, talking about the mood when I wrote this book, was uh, Chernobyl, and then, of course, the bomb. I mean, there was technology as a menace to human life, and it overshadowed, I mean, Hiroshima really overshadowed that period. I mean, I don't want to go. You don't want a detailed response at the moment. Mm -hmm. At the moment, then if you can, uh, it would be nice to hear from Professor Bass. Sure. We'll now have Professor Bass's response. My response, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, uh, <laughs> I'm nervous. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. And um, Professor Marks, it's indeed an honor for me to be here. Um, when I saw you lecture uh, as an undergraduate in the mid-80s, uh, it really affected the way I thought. And as a, a, bo as a boy growing up in New England, um, as a, a, actually on a farm, and um, now studying at RISD in, surround, in a very cosmopolitan world, um, you know, it really made me think about um, modernity and, and um, the kind of, you know, this kind of tension between the, the myth of abundance, if you will, and I, I would call it today, I think we call it scarcity. Um, the, in the inevitable realities of scarcity. And um, if I were to get to any set of questions, uh, I think they, they would, would be to, to think about how those things play out, um, how you think they play out, that myth versus that reality. Um, so I'll start with that. I'll try, and I'll try to keep my comments about this fairly succinct. I work as a designer, um, primarily 
um, in, as Gail mentioned, in a sort of contested territory um, um, uh, mode. And uh, I work in the California Central Valley, which is uh, the nexus of uh, California water politics, is a place called the Delta, which is a very interesting, complicated place. Um, California built uh, post-war an elaborate infrastructure of pumps, canals, you name it, um, which were uh, riddled with errors, as Keller Easterling might call them. And uh, those errors are extremely interesting today as we enter a new phase where the actual ability for the post-war engineering system to um, deliver uh, is, is run its course. So just yesterday in Congress, a very right-wing uh, re representative of a very right-wing district in the Central Valley proposed to overturn about 100 years worth of water law uh, and give, uh, essentially to turn upside down water right uh, traditions uh, uh, in California in order to serve the needs of his uh, clients. So. So there's one, of, one example at which we could talk about politics. And, and I guess at this moment, I want to make a distinction between technology and infrastructure, which is the primary subject of my interest. Uh, I would call infrastructure the, the sort of visible hand of technology. It's the thing that can be pinned down, the thing that, that can be observed, uh, the thing that can actually, in fact, must, and must be forced to uh, uh, settle pu public in some public sphere debate and ideological difference and and all of these things play out very explicitly in California water geography and and I've uh, so I'll leave that at that so maybe perhaps a comment about a distinction as you sh see hazard in relation to infrastructure probably less simply because it's it's not as shifty it's more visible um, but the, and then finally, um, a question about design agency. Um, I would say in the last 15 years, we've seen the rise of a new discipline. And I would argue that discipline does something very different than planning, than architecture or landscape architecture. Um, that discipline, landscape urbanism, um, is not without its, uh, I think, um, propensity to reification. It certainly is. And I would say the AA in London, so particularly, sort of egregious example of that. But on the other hand, I think there are forms of landscape urbanism. I will mar mark two, Keller Easterlings and uh, the lateral office in Toronto's that offer two models in which the political uh, can actually start to unmask the technological. Um, in Keller's case, it's through play. It's through a kind of mapping of the absurdities and, and, and uh, errors of, of these unseen systems. And in, in uh, Mason White and Lola Shepard's uh, work, it's actually through a, a kind of simulation, a parallel reality of the networks of technology as they exist, for instance, around the Great Lakes or the Salton Sea. So it's a kind of mapping of exchange and, and desire, a kind of socioeconomic uh, master planning uh, counter universe. And um, I, so I'll leave it at that. I'm, and the question I would say about that is whether whether landscape urbanism as you know it, and I assume that you care or can comment about it, Professor, um, has some kind of agency to be a critical force in, in um, sort of uh, making public questions about technology. I didn't get to Ulrich Beck, but his risk society uh, sort of comes out of this, uh, the, the need somehow to, to shape more publicly debate about the role of technology. Thank you. Uh, Professor Marx, do you have a reaction to this or a comment? I will wait. I will give other people a chance. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Professor Bass uh, presented a um, critical viewpoint that connects with uh, our understanding of uh, these networks of technology that uh, comprise infrastructure. And uh, I guess uh, my, my sense is, is your question you know, could these be hazardous insofar as there are many decisions that are being uh, made that are susceptible to uh, the political winds that are blowing at the moment, and do they begin to kind of take a life uh, 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 of their own uh, without the, the proper oversight and judgment? Well, clearly they're expressions of two, two sort of poles of ideology, right? So our congressman 
uh, in California's uh, Central Valley clearly represents the myth of abundance in California. We'll build new infrastructure, that infrastructure will, you know, we just won't give it to endangered species, right? We'll, we'll make r reservoirs and canals and, you know, if the fish die, so be it, because we're human beings and, you know, read the Old Testament, right? So, uh, and then on the other hand is the myth of scarcity. And I would, you know, I put Thoreau in that category, somebody who lives a profoundly conservative life, who understands the kind of balance of nature and man and wants to have a kind of humility in the face of larger ethical or moral um, decisions. So, the, you, know, my, you know, to me the question is how do you mediate? How do you reconcile? It's not a kind of either or choice. So, uh, and, I, and I think that's what I maybe, whether rightly or wrongly, took from the machine in the garden and found very interesting about this issue of the hazard, you know, because I think it plays out in terms of infrastructure very publicly. I don't think it's hidden. I think it is actually public. People do go to meetings. They do sort of complain to people when somebody proposes to build something because, in fact, infrastructure is the visible and physical representation of much of what we call technology, I'd say. It is the embodiment of it physically. Well, uh, I'm not sure where this is going, but I think I will take the opportunity to read Daniel Webster. Uh, in his time, he was a great orator. And this was an age when oratory was really important, when uh, people like Calhoun and Webster and, and of course, Lincoln were, paid, paid, were given great respect. And when uh, Webster tries to describe this, the extraordinary new power in his word, I think if you listen to the language and the rhythm, it conveys something that we can't quite say in our academic language. It is an extraordinary era in which we live. It is altogether new. The world has seen nothing like it before. I will not pretend, no one can pretend to discern the end, but everybody knows that the age is remarkable for scientific research into the heavens, the earth, and what is beneath the earth, and perhaps more remarkable still for the application of this scientific research to the pursuits of life. The ancients saw nothing like it. The moderns have seen nothing like it till the present generation. We see the ocean navigated and the solid land traversed by steam power and intelligence communicated by electricity. Truly, this is almost a miraculous era. What is before us, no one can say. What is behind, be, upon us, no one can hardly realize the progress of the age has almost outstripped human belief. The future is known only to omniscience. Well, that sense of this extraordinary, I mean, he is writing this, he's saying this only a few years bef after the invention of the railroad and the telegraph. And yet there is this sense of the total transformation of life at the hands of s some new power, which is unnamed and which will later be called technology. And I think <coughs> it's the missing term technology in Webster's speech that, that tells you the work that we've given this word. The, the concept of technology is what <coughs> came in to, exp to answer Webster's plea to understand this. And uh, I think that helps us realize the dimensions uh, that of the reach of the concept of technology, that it is, it became the all-purpose name for the transformation of modern life. Only <coughs> 10 years before, after the invention of the railroad and the telegraph just then. So it's an extraordinary, I think it gives you a sense of the burden we've put on the word technology to uh, account for the character of our modern post-industrial society. And uh, if I can just add, one gets a sense um, from listening to that, that uh, he's just in awe uh, at this kind of miraculous power. And he just can't find a way to, 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 to describe it any more so than what he has just said about it. But uh, this, this word 
uh, technology uh, is clearly missing, uh, and, and right. it becomes this thing that we invest with those very same meanings much later on. Right. I mean, I, it's, there are very few places in history where you have the sense that there's a vacancy that needs to be filled by a new concept. It's begging for some way to explain what's going on. And we resorted to the concept of technology to uh, fill this semantic void. I think the big important concept in my essay is the idea of a semantic void. The changes were occurring. Everybody knew it, but we, they didn't have a name for it. They didn't know what it was. And they put that burden on the concept of technology. I'll, I'll admit, I, I'm just uh, really taken with the power of, of Webster's words, and so much so that um, it was a little bit surprising for me to read in the essay about the critique coming from Thoreau representing dissident artists and intellectuals. Now, I can understand it, but uh, Webster has such a, such a kind of innocence and, and, it, and uh, a sense of, um, you know, just exhilaration uh, that, that it's, it, it catches, catches your own spirit. Yeah, well, Thoreau comes from the very opposite corner. And uh, in his, <coughs> his indictment of what was called technology is very telling. And uh, I would say it's very prescient. Yes. So I do think you have a, a real conflict here. Uh, and I think that's a good segue into Professor Williams and uh, the critical uh, take on, on this uh, concept that um, she, she's interested in. Is this, is this, is this working? No, we're not, we're, wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, it does work. Now it's, oh, it wasn't, okay. Right. Sorry for the noise. Do you want it on or off? I want it on, I want it on. Yeah. Got it? Okay, anyway. Uh, anyway, no, I don't, I don't have a critical take. I have a, uh, an educational take on this topic. Um, I mean, we're here to celebrate the 100th anniversary of an association that has the word schools in it, right? Collegiate schools. And I, I think that's a really great old-fashioned word. And so I would like to talk about Leo's essay from the point of view of someone who has taught it with Leo, uh, we've taught together for 10 years. And I just um, think that over that time, uh, I, have seen, I have seen two things that are worth recounting to you. The, the first is the value of organizing a class, and, we, and it's all been graduate teaching, but this would go for undergraduates, I think, organizing a class around one big question so that there's a thread of continuity and you're not just doing a series of topics, you're always coming back to the one big question. And the big question that Leo organizes his teaching around, at least in the last 10 years, is the question, why have we needed the term technology. What has happened in the real world that makes it necessary to have this word and concept? So you're relating what would normally be classified as intellectual history, uh, you're relating it to everything in history. What has happened in the world? This is both in people's thinking and in in material history, what has happened to uh, create the semantic void that became filled with the term technology? This is a question that, that it has no perfect answer, but it does have answers, some of which are presented in the essay. And I commend it to you as an excellent way to organize a class. Or more generally, I would just say, if you can think of similarly provocative questions as a way to organize your teaching. I, I think it really is a, is a useful way of keeping yourselves, that is the students and yourself as teachers, focused on important questions and not getting bogged down in 
this, that, and the other. And frankly, and not getting too academic about it all. What's going on in the real world? By the way, when you were reading Webster just now, all I could think of are the students, you know, I, I meet with daily, especially, especially the undergraduates, for whom technology is a wondrous, rapturous thing that has changed the world and made it completely different. I mean, all the things that Webster was saying, okay? That's the same language I'm hearing every day from my students who have a sense of world changing. You know, Facebook has changed the world. And appropriately enough, it's at the mass <laughs> <laughs> institution of technology. Exactly. That's right, I'll forget that. And this leads me, but this leads me to my second um, point. And, and I don't think it's true only of MIT students, maybe more of them than the rest. But the second point is the, that uh, <coughs> students today, our, my students today, I'll speak for mine, um, have, have such difficulty in grasping what Leo has written in his essay and in I mean, in making any sense of it whatsoever. Uh, I assign this essay, or I assigned its predecessor, regularly, I mean, I teach things like technology in history, or critical issues in STS, or, you know, just general undergraduate and uh, introduction to the history of technology. And whether it's STS or history of technology, I say, look, this is a key term, it's a key word, we've got to understand it. We've got to clarify our language from the start. Same with other terms, like science and society, but let's start with technology. We read the essay. I give them a very detailed uh, reading guide to Leo's essay, walking them through the questions they should be asking themselves, the terms they should be focusing on. It's a, very, it's a hard essay, even for graduate students. So I, I, have, the, I have the reading guide. And uh, we talk about it, we discuss it, and we talk about the importance of not using the word technology in, in a vacuum, not using it anachronistically unless we explain what we're doing, of understanding this term, and most of all, of not turning it into a historic agent. It's useless. It's completely useless. Within a nanosecond, students are talking about technology. And all through, I mean, all through the term, we, I keep coming back to, what do you mean by that? You know, is there another word that's more uh, pertinent to what we're talking about? Uh, we do an initial exercise sometimes. We've done this together, I do it on my own. The word technology, folks, students, will write on the blackboard, what do you think of when you think about technology? It's amazing, the list of, you know, from the most concrete to the most abstract things that, you know, that, anyway, t words that get listed. We do that. I mean, I really try very hard to raise consciousness about this key term and to get students out of the habit of appealing to it as the, the substitute for history. It's more than an agent. It is history now. Technology is history. It's, it's, what, what else is there? I have failed. I, I, I think you can say we failed. And I ask you, my question is not just for Leo, but, but what, for all of you, what can we do to encourage our students to think much more critically about the term, which in turn suggests a much more critical view of agency and history? Uh, Leo, do you have something to add? Uh, is that, is that she spoke for me. <laughs> Was I accurate? Absolutely. I think we're, we're going to hear from Professor J uh, Jarzenbeck, but um, soon we will open this uh, to you uh, for questions, and uh, I, I hope to continue uh, the discussion of some of the issues that um, uh, Professor Williams raised. I need help. <laughs> um, I thought so, slightly parallel uh, what Rosalind, I think, has said. Um, and then I will a a a end with an actual question. But I do want to first uh, say that I do agree that with, uh, with Professor Marx that the problem is not technology as such. We have to be careful that we don't see his work as sort of anti-technology or that there's a dialectic between technology and sociology as such. Uh, 
Um, but perhaps stated somewhat reductively, uh, technology is not a thing, it's not a field of expertise, but a social and discursive construct. That because of its purported intimate proximity to social realities now hides that social constructiveness sort of within its semantic deficiencies. And that's sort of where I find his article most interesting because it's sort of a question, a little bit like chicken and egg. I mean, is this a consequence or in fact, is this a means to something? And, and Professor Marx argues that it actually could be a type of means uh, allowing a certain agency to sneak in uh, unobserved and that we have to challenge it. But it could be the means to other things. So with this, I want to, I would like to eventually talk a little bit about, you know, I guess I put an adjective in front of technology, which would be the digital. Um, the reason being, of course, that, you know, we've all undergone this in our, uh, in our lifetime. And it is sort of, we talk about the proverbial shift between the analog to the digital, and I'm not interested in that really at all, but the shift between the, perhaps the literal to the metaphorical to now the metaphysical. And it's in that shift that we, I think, can see the, the, uh, the shift uh, or the escape of the concept of technology uh, into its uh, sort of designified location, if you can, if I can use a non-English word or somehow like that. So as an example, I was just yesterday talking to a colleague of mine in building technology. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell him we were going to do this, but I was sort of setting him up. I don't know, is he here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We're good friends. We're good friends. That's right. <clears throat> All right. And so we comment. We talked a little bit about the changes uh, that took place in that discipline the last ten years. So when I was a student and I took you know building technology, it meant you know figuring out steel beams and moment curves and hard things, uh, the knobs, the electrical wires. You know, will this span work and will that span work? And then when you finished designing, uh, whatever it was, you were done. Right? It was Miller time. And, and, and today, building technology is, still can do that, of course. It still has to operate like that. Uh, but that's really not what academia is interested in when it talks about building technology. You know, that's in the sort of the, 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 the demeaned professional practices. But high-end professional practices are already way, way uh, past that. Building technology there is really about systems, interactive realities, real-time adjustments to uh, life conditions, uh, geology, air, water, fluctuating inputs from a whole sorts of uh, realities, including human realities, right? So the technology is not stiff and hard, but, but lives in a sort of computational matrix that places it really close, uh, uncomfortably, or perhaps from a technological point of view, all too beneficially to the sociological realm. So I argue that we should get rid of the word building technology and come up with something like maybe building sociology with a little parenthesis. By the way, we also make things, you know, but basically to do building technology today, you have to be a practicing sociologist or anthrop cultural anthropologist or anthropologist of modernity. You know, you, you know that's really where building technology is going. And, and it'd be less and less about, you know, uh, making a steel building. Because you can do that, you just press a button and the computer can do that for you. So that's not what building technology is about anymore. So if building technology really and, and is really about sociology, anthropology, uh, technology itself now is, is the mediation that, you know, we can give us a greener environment, but also makes us, you know, just a pawn in some huge algorithmic sort of calculation that no one knows really what, where, what's, what's it doing, right? It's sort of the invisible Chernobyl that sort of spreads its sort of data fields in which all of us are breathing, acting uh, components of that. So anyway, sorry for a little bit for that long example, but I, I thought Leo's article struck a chord with me on the question of where, if you will, building technology sort of stands in sort of the question of this sort of shifting social. So technology has become itself a de-signifier uh, of, of, of some type of real world. Um, and it still leaves open the question of what is then out there that's at play in that space uh, that we call technology. And in a, in a sense, sort of technology has become sort of preeminently useful to describe sort of certain types of social practices. So um, that is both defined and simultaneously obscured, right? There's a sort of inner dialectic sort of to that term that um, just will seem to be perpetually haunt the system until we can find up some other, uh, some other new word. So that's what uh, Thank you very much for that comment. I, I'm, I'm seeing a theme running through these responses, which I find fascinating. I do think this idea of the hazardous concept of technology being one in which uh, the word does take on a, a, a life of its own, and um, 
all of the, these various uh, uh, fields, the data fields that uh, Professor Jarzenbeck referred to, um, or, or the infrastructural decisions that Professor Bass referred to, even the mass culture of uh, Professor Moore shed and uh, the students um, uh, uh, trying to get students to think critically, uh, all of this uh, to me kind of uh, points to a, a, narr a, a thread uh, that runs runs through uh, that suggests that it, it is the unknowability, the obscurity of it is what paradoxically makes it so powerful. I think I'm just repeating what uh, Professor Marx said, but uh, this is, um, um, I think, an issue f for all of us today. I don't have the answers, uh, but I, I think I do have more questions for the panelists. I hope they don't mind. Uh, just a few more, and then I would like to open it up to the audience. Uh, one question in particular, I think, is uh, for, for uh, Adnan Morshed, uh, I'm wondering, given your uh, specific interest in mass culture, what would you say was the contribution uh, to, of mass culture, of the things that you look at, to the spread of this notion uh, technology and the embrace of it so broadly? I'll start with you. Um, for me, mass culture, uh, which sort of began to shape American culture in the, uh, around the turn of the 20th century, and especially as you know that the interwar years is uh, many people would consider is the golden age of advertisements. And so uh, in the early decades of the 20th century, mass cultures propagated you know, almost in the propaganda sense, uh, in propagandistically, the, the kind of the role of technology, the technology, the mythical role of technology as the social transformer, as the kind of the agent of social transformation, that was so, that myth was so embedded in mass culture that I think uh, we can broaden uh, uh, Professor Marx's fascinating argument that technology acquired a, in the sort of a series of meanings that were perhaps not, uh, could not be conveyed by what uh, Carlyle called machinery in 1829. So I think mass culture, the space of mass culture, the space of popular culture, provides us a good uh, avenue f to explore how technology was was fed with these meanings in the early 20th century. Now I, will, I would even argue that the World's Fairs, uh, uh, science fiction magazines, science fiction as you would know that in, in America, science fiction magazines was, came, uh, you know, was, uh, 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 the first science fiction magazine was in 1926, inaugurated or initiated by Hugo Jernsbeck. And so science fiction, that kind of, even uh, science fiction magazines in the 1920s prop propagated the stories of H.G. Wells. So I think the, the actual experience of technology, rather than its literary metaphors, played a vital role in the technologies kind of the kind of these expanded meanings i think the popular culture provides a very very interesting set of ideas uh, especially i would like to again i would like to mention the works of uh, van brooks who ta who talked about who wrote a book a fascinating book actually in 1915 the america's coming of age in which he talked about highbrow and lowbrow, and which kind of, you know, in, in a way, you're kind of echoing George Santana's work on genteel tradition and what he called the, the other uh, 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 end of the spectrum, he, what he called the uh, aggressive enterprise, the low culture, high culture, lowbrow, highbrow, how these kinds of played out in the kinds of the technologies, drama of etymological, this filling up the, of what uh, Professor Mark called the semantic void. I think there's a tremendous research opportunities in the role of the uh, mass culture, popular culture, in, uh, in, in uh, signifying te technology as a kind of a social transformer, as an agent of social transformation. And Professor Marx, in a later article, talked about technological pessimism in which he called that because technology replaced what the founding fathers called the political will, it ultimately after World War II, after Hiroshima, after Chernobyl, after all kind of the, the specter of atomic explosion, the explosion of the hydro, uh, you know, hydrogen bombs and so on, 
uh, the, uh, w which eventually led to pe uh, postmodern pessimism in the words of Professor Marx, in fact results from this overindulgence in technology as the transformer of society, as the transforming agent of society. So I think, I think uh, going back to popular culture, I think there is a, there's a vast field, uh, vast opportunity, a robust opportunity to explore the meaning of technology uh, in, in popular culture. Thank you. Thank you. You want me to say something? If you would like. Well, <coughs> you know, the, the key word in the end of the essay uh, is the extent to which this concept of technology lends itself to reification. And uh, I'll read you the classic definition of reification and ask you to think whether this names the problem. Reification is what occurs when we endow a human activity with the characteristics of a thing or things. It thereby acquires, as he put it, a phantom objectivity, an auto autonomy that seems so strictly rational and all-embracing as to conceal every trace of its fundamental nature, the relation between people. In other words, when people use the word technology as the subject for active verbs, the technology makes things happen, they are disguising uh, human activities with things because technology as an abstraction can make nothing happen. It's a name for a certain kinds of human behavior. And the real problem is the disguising of the human within uh, the concept of a thing. Um, I, I can't, I hope I'm, uh, it's okay to, to, for me to take over I, because I just thought of something. It was sure. uh, from Jonathan Bass. Uh, when he, you were speaking about infrastructure, uh, the big infrastructural project that comes to my mind is a kind of shiny new thing recently was a Three Gorges Dam, relatively recently, in China. And uh, it, I, I wondered if, if, you know, something like this um, great, you know, dam that's going to provide us power and take us into the future, um, whether that, that thing as just this, this, this fix-all solution, you know, to, to advancing ourselves uh, um, as a society uh, masked, uh, you know, all, all of the other issues that, that came along with it. But I, I would just like to know your view on that. Of course. I mean, I entirely understand and agree with um, the definition and the view. You know, I guess the real question is whether the fact, whether once we acknowledge that a thing, that a, that a human activity has been reified, and instead we speak of the dam as, as the thing that's going to, um, let's see, take Chinese peasants out of out of a, uh, poverty and allow them to live good middle class lives, right? As opposed right. to some giant, your, your analogy of the cotton gin. Um, the question is, okay, if we, uh, if we unmask that and, and talk about human relations, and uh, I mean, that becomes a very, very, very difficult thing uh, from the point of view of design. I'll say that first of all. And that, as you know, I tried to couch my comments in relation to a kind of projective question of design. Um, having said that, I mean, I could have listed a hundred interests in human players in the California water things, everything from environmentalists to hermits to preservationists to water developers, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on. And they, they, they play in this fascinating world of human exchange that Truly, uh, I, I mean, in my case, I'm talking about infrastructure and uh, not technology, but in, in a way it's sca a scalable uh, notion, I think, and uh, I, I didn't mention it, but I, I think that uh, the semantic void you refer to between technology and the machinic also might be applied to infrastructure also being a word that comes out of the military and public works, um, which, which is a, a word that refers actually explicitly to some larger set of um, exchanges between people. Um, I'll leave it at that. Those in, in, in power and the decision makers. Well, the word public. Public, yeah. Not infrastructure, the, the phantom objectivity of a word like infrastructure, yes. it has that strong. In other words, when 
We use the word technology as an agent of change. We are really disguising the human role in it and attributing, attributing the human role to an abstract entity. And <clears throat> it's, in a sense, relinquishing our responsibility as, an, as intellectuals. I don't know, you know, you can say that in a, a lot of ways, but it's really a, a, an obvious uh, failure. Uh, how about questions from the audience? Uh, I, if, if I might just ask Professor Williams one, one last question, and it has to do with putting technology up on the board as a word and uh, having students define it. Is it uh, consistently a, a definition that uh, presents the kind of a seductive side of technology, or is there a awareness or evidence or interest in the uh, darker, darker side of things? No, it's, it's, I mean, I think the, the first reaction is usually progress and good things and improvement, but it doesn't take long when people start free associating to, to go elsewhere. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's all over, it's, it's a range of tone from negative to positive, and also, as I say, a range of, of just, um, um, you know, from the most abstract to the most concrete and, and everything in between, which, which is very helpful to everybody, but it still doesn't, I mean, there's, there's so many, it's so much conditioning in, in life today to keep talking about technology, and, and one class culture. doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, <laughs> It's like an addiction. I, I, I'm quite serious. Uh, it's hard to break. Actually, speaking of the addiction, uh, Professor Jarzenbeck, anything more about that? About what? <laughs> the addiction. 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 Technology. Building technologies. Um, Building technology. uh, oh. data, the data fields. Addiction. The whole life of, 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 of the technology. Okay, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I wasn't really talking about addiction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I was trying to point to, the, I guess, the, 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 the nub of, you know, the reification issue and sort of relate that to the metaphysical question. Right? So in other words, we have other metaphysical projects, um, let's say like the nation state, the um, uh, this idea of duty or whatever. I mean, there are um, metaphysical postulates out there that sort of float these abstractions. Uh, that are the core of sort of metaphysical realities, and you sort of join them, or you're forced to join them through sort of enforcement policies. You know, if you're if you don't do your duty, we're going to shoot you, or if you don't join the you know the nation state, you're a terrorist or whatever. You know, so there are certain ways in which all metaphysics sort of includes and excludes sort of itself. And that's sort of the traditional metaphysical project that comes out of Plato. And what I think was interesting for me about uh, uh, Professor Marx's paper was that we have a metaphysical project which we don't know where the inclusional enforcement is, right? Um, we all sort of participate in it in funny ways, in a very way, so we're not really addicted to it, right? We just sort of all of a sudden is sort of in our social, and we really haven't prepared ourselves for the critique uh, of that, right? So we, you know, until we sort of recognize his metaphysical operations, according to the way I read your paper, <laughs> um, you know, we can't begin to uh, produce any sort of semantic sort of a critique, and we're sort of stuck between a hard place and a rock, right, because we're already so far embedded in it that we can't, by the time we figure out what it is, it may be too late. So I, I read his paper very pessimistically. <laughs> <laughs> Take questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, actually, I would like to um, uh, address a question maybe to all uh, panelists uh, and uh, feel free to, to respond to it. Uh, Could you a little louder? Yeah, yeah, louder. So, uh, what I wanted to ask is <coughs> I wanted to link uh, Professor Mark's notion of verification. To, uh, I can't hear you. Can, yeah. Could you speak a little louder? Yeah. I w is it fine now? I wanted to link Professor Mark's notion of verification with uh, Heidegger's notion of uh, uh, when, he, uh, when he spoke about the, the essence of technology uh, in the question co concerning uh, technology in modern uh, society uh, to the notion of uh, standing reserve. Uh, 
when he talked about uh, technology as gestell, as in framing, and uh, technology as in framing creates and puts the world into a standing reserve in the sense of it is always open and recept uh, receptive to our intentionality, to the human intentionality. And I wanted to ask, how did the notion of technology change? Or do you see that the notion of technology changed since its inception in the industrial revolution through modern mechanics until uh, our digital uh, age now? If the notion of technology has changed uh, because what I think is that uh, from the Industrial Revolution on till now, we are still dealing with technology in the sense of a standing reserve. So I, I'm curious to, to, to hear maybe Professor Marx, what do you think about that? Thank you. Well, uh, I probably don't know my Heidegger as well as you do, but I, under I think I understand um, that Heidegger, Heidegger's idea of a standing reserve uh, could be applied to technology and I think particularly to architectural technology. Uh, but um, I don't know how to put that in plain English. Uh, <laughs> Heidegger always ends up mystifying me a bit. Uh, so I'm not sure I, what I can do the, with your question. Uh, could, could I point out, though, that you, that's the epigraph to the article is Heidegger? Yes. Is Heidegger, the essence of technology is nothing technological? That, that's, I think that's the phrase that I've heard Leo say repeatedly from Heidegger, and that really is more the essence of uh, what he's found in, in, uh, in Heidegger. Uh, it would, it'd be wonderful if you could explain standing reserve <laughs> as you see it, uh, as represented by Heidegger. I'll try to briefly do that in, in, in plain English. So uh, what, 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 what seems to be of high interest here is that how we, 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 um, we conceptualize and uh, deal with technology in terms of resources and how we deal with resources. We, so we see resources as inert matter and as, as a matter which is, which, which is only directed by the human will. Although matter has an intrinsic uh, capacity to uh, form, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, to generate processes, to uh, it has an inher inherent intelligence, and the, the the point which I want to, to to point at is that we don't let the resources and the organic intelligence to cooperate with our will. We are still uh, uh, dealing with the organic resources we have as if they are just inert matter. And this is the point where standing reserves comes in, as if they are just there to be directed by an anthropomorphic, an anthropocentric uh, intentionality. And the question is now if there is a possibility to think technology not as a top-down strategy imposed on the organic matter, but as a, a, a kind of um, cooperative thinking and acting with the organic intelligence. I hope I've made it a bit clear. <laughs> you know, in, in, um, in 1829, when Carlisle raised the question, what's the, what's the best name for this age? And the answer was, it's the age of machinery. At that point, the concept of technology did not exist. And uh, it's interesting that uh, today, uh, the word machinery seems very prosaic and old fashioned. And it's been completely absorbed in this much more sophisticated and almost metaphysical concept of, of technology. 
and I think that, I mean, one of the things we have to think about with the word technology uh, is uh, that it enables us to deceive ourselves that we, we have an explanation for an, a causal agent uh, in the world, uh, which we are not fully comfortable about uh, describing or understanding. Uh, I don't know whether that... So <clears throat> the concept of standing reserve may be a way out. Can you go further with that? Yeah. The wind mill is a, is a completely different approach to technology than, for example, the machine that put up the, uh, uh, a completely isolated uh, 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 machine which is, which is not uh, uh, dealing with the environment, which is not dealing with the organic matter, which is just programmed in order to reproduce mechanically and produce uh, certain products. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, my, my view is not, not speaking for Leo here. Right? Um, I mean, that's all fine, you know, yeah, I mean, like, but so what? You know, I mean, I think if you put matter as having its own, as you say, intrinsic value, this is putting one metaphysics into another metaphysics, right? In other words, defining human agency in our association with matter. I think the point uh, that I got from the article is that we really have to define human association between humans, right, and not how we deal with uh, resources as such. I mean, yes, it's a problem, right, we want to deal more critically with that, but that's not sort of the way out to get to technology, right? And I think, you know, the Heideggerian trap that we basically find in the material world some sort of hidden meanings that will leverage our individual ethics as opposed to our social ethics, right, for me is a mistake, right? And, right, because it, it doesn't ask how do we then go f multiply those individual ethics, you know, into some sort of social good. So uh, from what I understand from Leo's article, which, once again, my understanding, right, right, is precisely not to sort of go from, you know, the fire, you know, in, in, in into the, the, I don't know, the ice tray or whatever that might be, you know, <laughs> you know uh, but to ask how do we sort of withdraw from the compulsion just to continuously reiterate a, a positive or negative stance toward technology and ask, once again, more fundamental question about social relations. So, I don't know if you mind. I would, uh, 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 that's a fascinating set of questions, and I would like to read your question in a very particular context of American culture in the early 20th century, is that there were many people who talked about, you, you, you said, uh, it, could there be a kind of an antidote to kind of this top-down model of technology where inert objects are inert objects, and they are just uh, guiding our instructions. So I think in the, in the early 20th century, there, are, there were many theorists, there were many people, historians, talked about a kind of a, a unique kind of synthesis of man and machine. And uh, I could give you an example of uh, Frank, uh, Buckminster Fuller, and who talked about uh, uh, a man-machine synthesis, and in fact he, uh, he introduced a term called phantom uh, captain in 1938 in his book, uh, Nine Chains to the Moon, where he, where in, in the, what he meant by phantom captain is that a kind of, which can be explained by, I would say, uh, the example of, of Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic in 1927, and there were many people who said that Charles Lindbergh's significance, the significance of transatlantic flight, was not just this heroic machine crossing the Atlantic. It, the significance was really in the synthesis of man and machine. So the significance of Charles Lindbergh could not be understood without understanding the significance of Spirit of St. Louis. So in other words, Charles Lindbergh is Charles Lindbergh the hero, the American hero, the American hero, uh, you know, heroic pilot, aviator who crossed the Atlantic? His significance is as much about the significance of the machine that crossed him. So I think there were many people, and 
And uh, Buckminster Fuller talked about this kind of in very interesting uh, kind of uh, synthesis of man and machine. So I think you, what you were talking about in the context of Heidegger, though, so there were people, uh, there were people, there were instances in a particular context of American culture, there, there were theorizations of man-machine kind of nexus, there man-machine matrix that would be able to uh, build a fu uh, the future. So it's not the man alone, it's not the human agency alone, but it's complicity with technology, with the machine, that it could create a uh, better future, a buildable future. Another question. Only questions from the second row, stage left. Um, there, there have been a lot of words. I mean, I think the semantic void that we're in today seems to be the, the elephant in the room. So, but, but whether it's uh, cybernetics or, um, or uh, cyborgs or quasi objects or actor network actor networks there have been plenty of of uh, terms that have tried to re either replace or to 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 get to this heart of that it's not just thing it's that it's technology is not doesn't have agency by itself but i, I wonder w what accounts then for the resilience of this term or could, could we speculate on, on the term technology? Yeah, because I, I think or medium. I mean, McLuhan uses medium to try to get us away from it. I think so. There's been a number of potential replacements that have fallen by the wayside. And well, you know, I'd like to throw this question back to you guys, who are architects, because I mean, <coughs> computer aided design is, had a big effect on architecture. And it'd be interesting to, I mean, to know how you architects feel about that, its effect on your, on your art, if it is any longer an art, and, and whether it changed the balance between engineering and aesthetics in architecture. It seems to me you, you guys are in a very wonderful position to weigh the relative efficacy of the aesthetic and the engineering or technological. It's a, one of the characteristics of architecture that makes it so interesting. So let me throw it back. Uh, has that had a, from your point of view, has the introduction of more, if you'll pardon the expression, technology uh, <laughs> uh, into architecture, has that been a good thing? <laughs> I think the key is what Jarzenbeck was pointing out with the architectural technology is no longer the steel in the buildings. Therefore, when you put steel in buildings, it's like a hammer. And so computer-aided design is just like a pencil now. And so it's no longer technology, it's, it no longer has that mystification. So the key is it's, it's just a tool. And then what we're back to is the same old issues. Back to what? The same old issues. Oh. Right? So if we go back, it then becomes what do the people do in the building? It becomes sociology. It becomes how we live in it. And I think the almost fetishizing of the tool allows us to forget the fact that it's still just a building. And I think our desire to imbue it with that sort of mystification is because we no lo we feel like it's boring um, to actually play with the basics and we want to grab the next best thing. So even the, what you read earlier um, was this fascination with this new age, this, the, the, the desire for that next great thing. And I think it's a sort of a, a, a human desire to keep grabbing forward rather than saying the issues are still the same, we're just using different tools. And in the interlude, I'll just sort of say, I think we've gone from computer-aided design to uh, computer-aided architecture to architecturally-aided computation. <laughs> we're we're past to, computer, to, right? To, to what? To architecturally. Architecturally. 
architecturally aided computation. Aided computation. computation right? yeah. Computer aided design, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's not just another tool. <laughs> Hi, I'm actually a landscape architect, not an architect, but I work with a lot of architects. And one of the things that concerns me and that I've seen in practice and in academia both is that technology is very much uh, transforming physical space into something that derives into something very much this new machine that we don't really understand very well in terms of <coughs> the significance of the agency to society or to the politics that you were talking about earlier. And so it's a direct output of machine space without this other layering. Um, and I keep talking about that. Well, how can we infuse that other cultural aspect back into that machine so that it has meaning and that we can identify with it? Um, I know that's kind of obtuse, but that's what I'm after. And yeah. thank you for this discussion. Could I um, ask a question about that? I mean, in what it, you you mean it in a very particular way, since again, the word technology is transforming. You know, that would have been relevant. 200 years ago or more. So how you seem to be point, critical of certain dark ways in which technology is transforming space. So uh, could you be more specific about, do you mean, for instance, surveillance networks? Or do you mean bollards um, and, and sort of mapping of security? I mean, what, what, do, what do you mean? out of the bag, you know. I mean, you mentioned the Middle East, and as I was thinking about this talk in oil and Dubai and architecture, and um, you know, architectural, mm, there's been a lot of talk about Dubai, a lot of fascination with it. And yet it is, I mean, as a thing, very much a product of technology, is it not? Uh, and and in, in the ways that are quite, I mean, going back to the previous or the first question about in what way has technology changed? Well, one of the ways is through its scale. And it's, it's I think this is implied in the essay, the, the radical shifts in scale, the accumulation and concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. So, so when the railroad came along, all of a sudden you had a much greater concentration of wealth than you would have had in previous versions. And, and then when you apply that to, to oil, you get a very, even a different scale so of, of concentration. So, uh, you know, the, I don't know what the answer to your question is, except probably, as Manfredo Tefuri said, at a moment of less cynicism, just build well. You know, I mean, I don't know how you escape um, the, the, you know, to think you're going to sort of play the game of whack-a-mole with something as big as technology and figure it out, I just don't know how you do that. Um, I'm fascinated by this uh, idea of the semantic void uh, that the words strive to fill, and I was sort of thinking, projecting into the future, what's our semantic void right now that we're sort of building and striving to fill? Well, I should imagine if it might have a special meaning for architects. Is there some development in architecture which has yet to be named, has not yet conceptualized? I, don't, I certainly am not qualified to answer the question. Well, architectural aided comp computation is a good start, I, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going home without <laughs> I, I think that uh, Professor Marx's scholarship provides a very fertile ground for new kinds of research in the digital era. What kind of questions does technology pose in the digital era? And I would like to just, um, uh, I think he's, the questions he asked, uh, uh, you know, 10 years ago or even 19, in 1964 in his book, could be reposed with the equal fervor, with equal intensity, 
in, in, in our digital era. And, but what I really find very interesting is that, think about Professor Marx's work. He, in his uh, article, The Hazardous Tec uh, Concept of Technology, he ends the article with the kind of the rather anxiety that technology is superseding human agency. Human agency is rather gi being given a second class status in the realm of technology. So there was a kind of a humanist ethos in his, in his question, a kind of a uh, humanist anxiety that uh, human mind should be perhaps reclaimed as he mentioned to my question that he wrote his book in the direct aftermath of Chernobyl and in the, in the atomic age. But my, uh, what I really find interesting that his question could, could be reposed in the digital era with the understanding that some of the uh, sort of cyber gigs, whatever you want to call them, people who unleash this rhapsodic uh, worshipful comments about that digital technology would change our lives and so on. They are trying to create the mind that discards or denigrates what they call the meat space, the body. They, they see that body is no longer required. Mind is what is what would be the future. So now they are ap uh, approaching these supreme utopia of the mind by means of technology. Technology is their vehicle to arrive at the utopia of the mind that Professor Marx actually was, was showing his anxiety about. So my question is, this is a paradox, this is the supreme paradox that we are trying to approach the utopia of the mind where body is no longer required, the flesh, the meat uh, is no longer required, that utopia of the mind is being, uh, is facilitated by these, uh, by technology, by these digital media and so on. So I think that really poses a very epist a new sort, a set of epistemological questions for us in the digital era. Okay, we're at 5.30, we can take just one more question. Maybe this isn't as much a question as a response to um, Professor Mark's question about is architecture an art or what are the kind of relationships between technology and um, in, in the discipline right now, and of course it depends in, on where you are in the right. discipline or the practice, but I, I, as I listen to this discussion, I still think a lot about this idea of, you know, the, the what, what was it, the architectural? Aided computation. Right, architectural aided computation. Get used to it. <laughs> and for me, well, right, it, it does tie back into a notion of those things that can be quantified or measured in some seemingly objective way, like this objective sort of phantom quality you're describing, and a real discomfort I see, at least in my students and many others, with things that can't be so clearly measured. We can measure wind flow, we can measure temperature, we can measure deflection in a beam. We can't necessarily measure complex social relationships or political, I mean, we try to map them and visualize them, but ultimately these are things like love and hate and joy and, and pain, which are not so easily quantifiable. And so I think there's been a real um, uh, abdication of responsibility on the part of architects to actually take on those things which are poetic, which are, are beautiful, which are artistic. We're not even allowed to use the words aesthetics, ethics, beauty. These have been removed from our language um, for the sake of those things which can be measured and then hence computed. So I think ar there is no art in a lot of architecture right now. I think it, it, if that includes things which may involve the subjective as well as the measurable or the, the seemingly known. That's at least one architect's view of architecture. So it's all about technology, I think, right now. We're going to end I don't on a like it. gloomy yeah. note. <laughs> oh, I think it's awful, but I actually think that's where it is. And I do agree I, with I Mark. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that's true, really. I mean, I, 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 you may be right about words like beauty, but I don't know that a word like eth I, to look ethics and beauty, the word ethics and or the to say ethics are banned and beauty is banned to put those two things together. I, it's I the truth a, and beauty I argument. Agree with that. I think ethics actually, you know, in, in my 
small world, which is quite provincial and remote, and I mean, certainly it's there. And, and, and in my Microphone. network, Microphone. Of, and, in, and in the network of people that I stay in touch with, which is quite a lot larger, I, I don't think that ethics actually has gone anywhere. Uh, in fact, I think it's grown uh, to be a more serious topic. Uh, I don't think, you know, now when I say that, I don't necessarily mean that forms of communication like satire or a kind of Swiftian version of what is ethical isn't sh and shouldn't be available. I, I actually think it should be. Um, so I, I don't have a narrow view of what that word means, but actually I think it's an incredibly important thing and, what, and very interesting and generative one as well. So um, beauty, you know, I mean beauty gets conflated a lot with cool. And so, you know, what that is is more difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, if any, uh, my suspicions w with regard to the digital have to do with that nexus of the cool, the, unique, the new, and uh, the beautiful. And, uh, you know, I'm deeply suspicious of that. But uh, the ethics of it, I, I think, are actually a good lens to under try to come at beauty. I mean, the, what's the, the historian at um, Harvard's name who wrote the book about um, beauty and justice? Um, Elaine Scarry, yeah. I mean, I, I think she has some very important things to think about there. Yeah. It's a more positive note. I'd uh, like to thank Leo Marx and our panelists, uh, and uh, to thank you as well. <laughs> Even justice and technology. <laughs>